Lord Jesus, your story has changed so many of our lives and lives of people all through history all around the world. And so we pray that today as we gather here in the worship center and the family worship venue, and as we gather with friends and people who are part of this church around the world online, that we will just encounter you in a fresh new way. That your story will speak to our hearts at a deeper level than it ever has, or maybe for some people for the first time. That we will encounter you as you come to encounter us. So Lord, speak to us and teach us and open your word to us. And let this Christmas at a deeper level make more sense than Christmas ever has before. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Well, this Christmas season here at Shoreline Church, we've been kind of coming at Christmas from a unique perspective. We, we've started each week uh, kind of stepping back into the world of the Old Testament to the prophetic words that were given 700 years before Christ came, 1,000 years before Jesus came. We've kind of walked back in the Old Testament and we've heard these prophetic words. There were over 60 prophecies given of Jesus all of them came true and were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We've started in the Old Testament, that, that first two-thirds of the Bible, God's Word, and we've, we've read about those prophetic words, and then we've walked into the New Testament, into the time of the coming of Jesus, and we've seen how Jesus became the fulfillment of those prophecies. Ones that were staggering and amazing. And then we've taken it one step further. I don't think it's enough just to look at the Old Testament prophecies and what they said about Jesus and then look at how Jesus fulfilled them. But we have to ask the question, if Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, how is Jesus at work now? What does that mean for us today? Does the fact that, that Jesus was prophesied and the fact that he came and fulfilled the prophecies have any impact on us today? And the answer is yes, massively. But an interesting thing about these different prophecies is that the ones we've looked at so far, they were kind of, kind of positive or interesting or inspiring. The first one we looked at was out of Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus came. And, I, and Isaiah said, he'll be born of a virgin, he'll be Emmanuel, which means God with us. That sounds pretty exciting, God coming with us, among us. So, so Isaiah prophesied that, and then Jesus came, born of a virgin, Emmanuel, God with us. And then we talked about just the reality that, that the fact that he's Emmanuel means he's still God with us today. That if you come to the cross and receive Jesus Christ and become his follower, he is Emmanuel, God with you all the days of your life and all the way into eternity. That's amazing. And then we looked at another prophecy out of Isaiah. We looked at a prophecy 700 years before Jesus came where Isaiah said, this one, this Messiah who comes, this Messiah who will be born, he will be called the Prince of Peace. And when Jesus came, the angels declared, peace on earth on, upon those on whom his favor rests. And even though, even though the, the people in Jesus' day were anticipating a peace that would be a militaristic peace, almost a kind of crushing of the Roman powers and a lifting up of, of God's people, that wasn't the way Jesus came to bring peace, but he came and he brought peace then, and he will bring peace forevermore. So if Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and if you become a follower of Jesus, guess what? You bear his peace into the world. And we saw that video clip of, of, of in World War I, the first Christmas of World War I, where soldiers came out of their trenches and out of the foxholes in some places along the Western Front and greeted each other, played soccer and exchanged Christmas treats and had a moment of peace. But then, as we know, the war continued. But when you're a follower of Jesus, even as Isaiah prophesied, he'll be the Prince of Peace, and Jesus came the Prince of Peace. If you walk in the presence of Jesus, you bear his peace. And so we get to be the ones in our crazy world, of all people, who can say, let's find peace as best we can. Because the one who dwells in us is the Prince of Peace. And then we talked about the, this really interesting and strange uh, series of prophecies in the Old Testament that said that where the Messiah would come from. And what's so unique is that the prophet said, well, the Messiah will be from Nazareth, he'll be a Nazarene, but, but also the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem, and oh, by the way, the Messiah will come out of Egypt. He said, well, how does one person, you know, come from Nazareth and Bethlehem and Egypt? In the world, in the ancient world, there were ways to travel around easily. These are places that are very spread apart. And yet Jesus came from Nazareth because of a government edict. His family is sent to Bethlehem and he happens to be born, it just happens to be born in Bethlehem. And then through, through an angelic vision, he's sent with his family off to Egypt so they don't get killed by this crazy King Herod. 
So it just turns out that Jesus was from Nazareth, was born in Bethlehem, and he came out of Egypt. But, but you go, well, that's impossible. No, it's not. These prophetic words were given by God, by his Holy Spirit, and Jesus fulfilled all of these. But all those different prophecies we've looked at so far are kind of positive or interesting or inspiring, but the prophecy we're going to look at today is heartbreaking and painful and difficult. Because in Psalm 22, King David wrote this psalm inspired by the Holy Spirit that became prophetic all through the psalm. It describes the death of Jesus, the death of the Messiah. Before Jesus came, you know, where he would be born was predicted and, and who he would be was predicted, but how he would die was predicted. And in a sense, when Jesus was born, and you'll see this image up on the screen, in a sense, there was sort of a shadow of the cross hanging over the manger. Because the way that Jesus would die, crucified, bearing our sins and our shame and our punishment on himself on the cross, we understand that he was born to die. That the prophecies of his birth came centuries before he came, but the prophecy of how he would die in, in Psalm 22 was written a thousand years before he was born. So wrapped up in the birth of Jesus and the manger, there's this reality of the presence of the cross and how Jesus would die. And I was thinking about that. It's such a strange thing to think about, think about that a, there's been a prophecy of how he would die even before he was born. Because the reality is when we see newborn babies, there's certain things we're thinking about. There's certain, you know, it's kind of a positive, joyful moment. And so, so here's just a bunch of different sweet little babies. And, and babies are just, it's, you know, whether newborn, a month old, two month old, they're just, they're just by definition cute and beautiful and wonderful. And when we see them, we start to wonder what lies ahead for them. You know, I, I know the three times I was in the hospital with my wife when our boys were born, looking at these little newborn babies, wondering what lies ahead. We ask questions when a baby's born. It's interesting, and particularly dads like to do this. If they have a son that's born who's, who's quite um, heavy or tall, you know, they say, oh, they're 95th percentile. You know, it's like, you know, they're, you know, they're, and you're, and it's gargantuan, giant child. And they say, oh, they're, oh, I wonder if they're going to be, a, you know, a, a, you know a, an athlete, or I wonder if they're going to be a big, you know, and they talk about how, how big they might be, and they're wondering about that. Or, or, or if parents have a, a little boy or girl who's just very kind of quiet and calm from the beginning. Not that they don't cry, but there's just kind of a calmness. Parents start to wonder, I wonder if they'll be just kind of, a, kind of a peaceful, not just a child, but kind of a person. We start to wonder. I had a funny thing when our first son was born, and when he was really little, I found myself wondering what his voice will sound like when he's old enough to talk. I don't know why, just that was something that went through my mind. In all the, but on all the years that I've been a pastor, I've gone to hospitals to see people's newborns and, and, and been with friends when they got to see their newborn baby. Here's a question I've never asked anybody. I've never looked at their newborn little girl or little boy and said this, hey, I wonder when they'll die. That would be kind of creepy, right? And that would be strange. Yeah, I wonder, I, wonder what's gonna, I, wonder, I wonder how they'll die. Will it be an accident? Will it be of old? Let's talk about their death. We don't talk about death at the beginning. That's not what we're thinking about. But for Jesus, he was born to die. And it's all wrapped up together. And if we're going to celebrate Christmas the right way, we have to celebrate the whole story of Jesus. And we kind of like Christmas to be the, okay, it's the happy baby Jesus and the manger, and it's really wonderful, but, but all wrapped up in that, wrapped up in the coming of Jesus and his birth in Bethlehem is the reality that Jesus is eternally God before all time. That God came among us, Emmanuel, born amongst us, that he was born in a manger, born in Bethlehem. That he lived a life with no sin and no wrong, perfectly before the Father. That he died on the cross for our sins to bear our shame, to take all of our wrongs and wash them away. That he would be in the tomb for three days dead. That he would rise again in glory on the third day. He would walk around and share meals as the resurrected Lord shared meals and conversations and teaching and then he would ascend to the right hand of the Father. And he would send his spirit to be with us and in us. And that he will come again one day and we will be with him forever. That's all part of the story. It's not just the baby born in the manger. We have to look at the whole story, all of it together. So this Christmas, we're looking at this whole amazing, powerful, beautiful story. And so that means that at the birth of Jesus, we have to understand why he came and why he was born. Why Emmanuel, God, came among us. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Psalm 22. 
If you have your phone or your tablet, you may want to open up your Bible app and, and go to Psalm 22. Or the words will also be up on the screen. I'm going to read portions of this psalm. Remember, David wrote this psalm a thousand years before Jesus came. But it precisely paints a picture of how Jesus would die. How the one born in Bethlehem would bear our sins and die on the cross. Follow along with me in Psalm 22. If you know the crucifixion story, if you've read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll recognize that there's multiple prophecies from this one psalm that, 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 that David prophesied that would be fulfilled completely and perfectly in Jesus Christ. So the psalm begins with these words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you know the gospel stories, you know that those were words that Jesus cried out while he was on the cross. And you have to understand that in, ancient, in the ancient Jewish world, every Jewish person, when they heard those words, they would have gone to Psalm 22. They knew their Bible. They knew their Psalms. So as Jesus hung on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All of their minds would have gone to Psalm 22 because that Psalm was prophesying how the Messiah would die. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. That's that picture of hanging, you know, hanging on the cross, the, the, the duration, the pain of all of that. But I am, a, verse six says this, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. He'll let God deliver him. And then verse 14. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It is melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd. And my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. The people stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. If you know the gospel stories, if you've read the ending of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know that there's so much in this, in this simple psalm that's saying this is how Jesus will die. Now, this, this is coming from a psalm. This is the psalm of David. But with all of David's suffering, he never encountered anything like this. David is talking about, it's almost like David's talking about himself. I've gone through these things, but he hasn't gone through these things. This is why it's prophetic. God is speaking to David. He writes this psalm pointing beyond himself. Now, David, and we, we've talked in the past about telescoping, that one, a theological term for how some prophecies would be sort of fulfilled in the present moment, but then would expand their fulfillment and have an ultimate fulfillment, in this case, in Jesus Christ on the cross. As David's looking at his own suffering, he had lots of suffering he went through. And if you know David's story, King David, he had lots of suffering and he had lots of pain in his life, but nothing like this. What he's describing isn't what he went through. He's describing something beyond himself. It's, this, it's a prophetic word. And so you have the, the king of Israel, David at that time, pointing to the ultimate king of Israel and all the universe, to Jesus, saying he, the ultimate king of Israel, is going to go through all this. This is a prophecy pointing to the Messiah who would come as a suffering servant. This prophecy is saying there's one who will come who will be the Messiah, but he will come to die. He will come to suffer and bear our sins and is pointing to it in advance. And the fulfillment of the prophecy is that the Messiah came. That the, the Messiah actually came. So David, a thousand years in advance, is saying that this Messiah will come and he will come and he will die and this is how he will die. And it will be public and it will be shameful and it will be brutal and it'll, it'll involve hands and feet being pierced, people gambling over his clothing, all of these things. And prophecy after prophecy sort of tumbles out of this psalm when you read the life of Jesus. If you could have sat on the hill of Golgotha watching what Jesus went through with Psalm 22, a scroll of Psalm 22, you could have simply gone, check, check, check. Check, all these things are being fulfilled in Jesus. Now, here's what's fascinating. David, in minute detail, paints a picture of crucifixion a thousand years before Jesus came. But crucifixion didn't exist until 700 years before Jesus came. 
This prophecy is not only a thousand years before Jesus, it's 300 years before anybody had invented and come up with the concept of this public, brutal form of execution, this deterrent to keep criminals from you know, committing crimes by publicly hanging people on a cross. Didn't exist a thousand years BC. There's no historical evidence of any record of any nation executing people that way. So David is not only prophesying and painting a picture of something that hasn't happened yet, it hasn't happened yet in any way in any place. Here's the history of crucifixion. In the 7th and 6th centuries BC, the Assyrians, Babylonians, and Persians sort, sort of invented, uh, invented crucifixion. That became a way that they would publicly execute criminals. The, the, Alexander the Great brought that form of execution to the Mediterranean countries in the 4th century BC. The Phoenicians introduced crucifixion to the Romans in the 3rd century B.C. And the Romans for five centuries sort of perfected crucifixion. It became a primary way that they would execute people. And then when Constantine came, Constantine, who was a, was a Christian emperor, actually abolished crucifixion. And it, ceased, it ceased to exist as a way of, of um, executing people. But in all of that, in 800 B.C., 900 B.C., and 1,000 B.C., there's no historical record of any crucifixions. And yet David paints a picture of something that doesn't even exi exist yet. David must have, even as he wrote these words in this picture, it's just, it, just, it, it came from the Holy Spirit. But it pointed the way to the coming of Jesus. And Psalm 22 is fulfilled in the death of Jesus, as recorded in the Gospels. A thousand years after the psalm was written. If you have your Bible still open to Psalm 22, just know, I'll just walk through some of the verses in the psalm and you'll see, get this picture of how this is fulfilled. In Psalm 22, verse 1, we read, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus reaches into the scriptures and cries out from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why is he doing that? Because at that moment... He is being abandoned by the Father because the holy, holy, holy God who cannot look on sin looks away from his Son who's bearing our sins and taking our shame. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus points to what he's going through. And then in 22, Psalm 22, verse 7, we're told that he's surrounded by others who scorn and despise him. And if you read the Gospels, you know that Jesus is surrounded by these people who are scorning him, who despise him, who mock him, who make fun of him. And that mocking and that scorning is coming from the guards. It's coming from the crowds. It even comes from the other people who are crucified near him. Initially, both of the thieves were mocking him, and then one of them repented and cried out. And Jesus said, today, you'll be with me in paradise. But he's being mocked by the guards, by the crowds, and by the other people being crucified. All that was fulfilled in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And Psalm 22, verse 8 we're told that he trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. And in Matthew 27, 43, that's exactly what the enemies of Jesus said. Oh, he trusts in the Lord. Let God deliver him. They word for word quote what the psalm said they would say. Fulfillment after fulfillment after fulfillment. In Psalm 22, verse 16, it says that he'll be surrounded by a pack of villains. And we know that on both sides of him when he's on the cross are criminals. He's literally surrounded by criminals while he's dying on the cross, and that's fulfilled. And in Psalm 22, verse 16, we're told that his hands and his feet will be pierced and mauled and disfigured. And all of it came true. When you read Psalm 22, you, you have this picture. So here, here, here David is prophesying a form of death that hasn't been invented yet. A form, a form of execution that nobody's even really entertained or thought of yet. And he paints a picture of it. And then Jesus comes and kind of line by line by line by line, he fulfills it. Even to the point where people are ga gambling over his clothing. They divide his clothing and what what's going on there. All that comes true in his crucifixion. And so we have to ask the question, well, if David prophesied it, if it was fulfilled in Jesus Christ the Messiah, multiple prophecies are fulfilled from Psalm 22. Then we say, well, does, does it matter today? The fact that this one born in the manger was born to die, does it matter today? And the answer is yes, more than anything else in all of history and all the world. What Jesus did matters. Because when God looks at the human family, God only sees two kinds of people. I mean, we, we divide people up you know, by, by economic background and by cultural background. We have all these ways and we, we're being you know, fractionating people in so many ways in our culture. It's getting to you know, the point where it's just like us, all these different groups and things. And God only looks and sees two kinds of people. 
Here's what God sees. Those who have come to receive Jesus' death on the cross and the love of the Father and become part of his family. God sees all those who've received this gift of Jesus as a payment for their sins and become part of his family. That's one group God sees. And here's what else God sees. The people that he wants to receive Jesus and become part of his family. That's all that God sees. Those that have already received his grace and those that the Father longs would receive their grace and to come, come home to him. The Bible, the Bible says that, that, that God longs that none would perish, but all would come to a knowledge of salvation. And Jesus came to offer himself for all people, all who would receive. But what God doesn't do is God doesn't force us. God invites. God makes himself available and his grace available through Jesus Christ. And so we have to understand the prophecy that the Messiah is here today, that Jesus Christ the Messiah is here and present and powerful and still at work. So here's the question. Why reflect deeply on the death of Jesus when we're celebrating his birth? Because it's all one story. And I, I even suspect that some of you, as you were watching the video this morning on the screen, were wondering, it started out, it started out with the manger and Mary and Joseph and the baby. Okay, there's Christmas. There it is. There's Christmas. But it began to walk into the cross. Well, that's, that's Good Friday, you know? <laughs> no, no, no. That's every day of our lives. The story of Jesus is one whole. And his coming and his life and his death on the cross and his burial and his resurrection and his ascension and his presence and power with us right now, they're all bound together. In the heart of God, and if you're a follower of Jesus in your heart, and if you don't yet know Jesus, you need to know this, it's all bound together in the heart of God. And so to understand who Jesus is, is, is to really understand the whole story, not only of, of God's heart, but to understand your own story. And our lives make sense when we understand the story of Jesus. You know, I grew up in a home, I grew up in a home with no faith. Um, I didn't have any friends that went to church. I grew up in Southern California in an area where it just wasn't a very churched area. And, I, and my, my parents didn't read Bible stories to us. We didn't have any religious connection. I don't think I'd ever seen or held the Bible until I, almost to the, the point I became a Christian. But when I came to know the story of Jesus, my story started to make sense. My life started to make sense because it's all bound up together. And so I want to share with you just in, in four kind of simple movements the story of Jesus. And if you're a follower of Jesus, drink this in and hear again what God has done for you. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, listen closely and open your heart and say, could, you know, could there be something in this for me? Could the story of Jesus impact my story and give me purpose and direction and guidance and hope and forgiveness? So the story of Jesus begins with God's love. Jesus came as a gift of love. So many people think that God's starting point is anger. Man, I'm fed up with you. I'm tired of this and that, and I want to get you for what you did. That's not where the story begins. The story begins always with the love of God. John 3, 16, the most well-known verse in all the Bible, says this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It starts with the love of God. 1 John 4.10 says this. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It starts with the love of God. It has to begin there because here's the deal. We can't figure it out without God reaching to us and loving us. So God's love is the start of that story. Second thing in the simple story of Jesus, our problem, that Jesus came to deal with our problem. The biblical term for our problem is sin. Doing wrong things, thinking wrong things, saying wrong things. I still remember when I became a follower of Jesus, when I became a Christian almost 16 years old, I started asking most of my friends because most of them didn't know Jesus and they didn't go to church and they didn't have any faith at all. And one of the questions I would ask him is, hey, I gotta ask you a question. If you, and, and you, I know you probably don't believe in God, but if, if there was a God who was just totally perfect in every way, I'd ask my friends, would that God look at you and say, hey, you're totally perfect too? What do you think all my friends said to me? What do you think? No. <laughs> no. My friends were like, oh man, I do stuff every day. I shouldn't have, if there was a perfect God, no, that God wouldn't look at me as perfect. I said, that's sin. The things we think that we shouldn't think, the things we say we shouldn't say, the things we do we shouldn't do, the good things we should do that we just don't get around to or don't care enough to do. 
And so Romans 3.23 says this. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every human being, except for Jesus Christ, has done wrong things, thought wrong things, and we fall short of God's glory. And Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. That's the consequence. The good news is there's a God who loves us. The bad news is we have a problem. And our sin, our sin separates us from God and pulls us away from him in a way that we can't get back to him in our own power. But this God who loves us gave a solution to our problem of sin. And that's the third thing in this story. God's solution is Jesus is the final solution to the biggest problem in all of human history, the problem of sin. That, that, that Jesus Christ is God's solution. Romans 5, 6 to 8 says this. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though, you know, for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the solution. When we were messed up, when we were sinful, when we were separate, when we didn't have a chance to make our way back home, Jesus died for us. And you know what we oftentimes do? We oftentimes say, well, okay, I'm kind of checking out the whole God thing. I'm checking out the whole Jesus church thing. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to clean my life up and get good enough so then I can kind of come and present myself to God and say, okay, God, I'm good enough now to be in your club. It doesn't work that way. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why? Because we couldn't clean ourselves up enough to make ourselves presentable. So God said, I'm going to clean you up. I'm going to give you a way through Jesus. And if you'll receive him, you're washed clean. All your sins are gone. All your shame is gone. All your guilt is gone. And you have cleansing through Jesus. God's solution is Jesus. And then our response, because Jesus offers himself, we can respond. Our response to respond to the gift Jesus offers us, to say, I, I want what he offers. I want his forgiveness. I receive it. But we have to choose. Jesus doesn't force us. He offers himself to everyone. And again, God looks at all the people in all the world of all time. He sees two groups of people. Those who've received his forgiveness through Jesus who become part of his family and those he still wants to know that he loves them too. And so we read these words in the book of Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 about our response. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. That means he's boss, he's in charge, he's, he kind of rules my life. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, he's in charge of my life. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Wow. God's love, our problem. God's solution is Jesus, our response. We can choose to respond to Jesus. And so as you think about that, what's it mean to be, to be embracing the prophecy and the fulfillment and to walk with the, the Messiah? What's it mean to understand that, that, that David wrote this psalm and prophesied that, 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 that the Messiah would give his life, he would suffer? And we find out in the scriptures the reason for that is to pay the price for our sins. Then, then, then how do we respond to that? Well, I'm going to talk to two groups of people. God's Christmas gift, if you've already opened it. Some of you have... have like I did when I was 16 years old. Some of you have come to a moment where someone told you the story of Jesus. It was your, your dad or your mom, your grandpa, or your grandma, a Sunday school teacher, a friend. Somebody told you the story. You heard a pastor preach a message and they said that God offers this gift of forgiveness and new life and friendship with God if you'll receive it. For many of you, there was a moment where you said, I want Jesus. I embrace Jesus. I, I, I take him to myself and I allow his forgiveness to wash me clean. If that's you this Christmas season, here's my encouragement celebrate the manger, celebrate the manger that God came, Emmanuel, God with us. Man, enjoy the manger, enjoy the beauty of it, the power of it, God came among us. But also celebrate the cross because he paid the price on the cross. He was prophesied, he would come and his hands and his feet would be pierced and he would be mocked and he would be surrounded with, with villains and, all, and it all came true. So celebrate the fact that he paid the price for you on the cross. Celebrate the empty tomb. Yeah, at Christmas, no, that's, that's Easter. No, that's every day because the whole story is bound together. So celebrate the empty tomb because he lives, amen? amen? He lives and he's present. And then celebrate his presence because he's with me. He is still Emmanuel. He is still God with us. 
So if you've come to the cross and received Jesus, just listen closely. Walk with him more than you ever have before. And when you walk with him, I will guarantee at times you're going to stumble and you're going to fall. You're going to make bad choices and you're going to say things you shouldn't say and you're going to do things you shouldn't do. And the enemy is going to come and say, guilt, guilt, guilt. God doesn't love you anymore. But while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. You know he still loves you. And I look at like a good parent with a little boy or girl who falls down. They go and pick him up. And they dust him off. They say, okay, keep trying. Keep going. And some of you need to hear that this Christmas season. Some of you are kind of pulling back from Jesus because you've kind of fallen and stumbled into something. But say, Jesus, pick me up, dust me off, and let me live for you again and follow you again in a fresh new way. Walk with Jesus this Christmas season and into the new year. And know that when, that, that, that when you struggle, when you fall, he's ready to pick you up and just remind you, that's why I died. That's why I gave my life. And if you're here today, or if you're online, or if you're in the family worship venue, and you say, well, God's Christmas gift, uh, I've never received it. I've never received it. Well, I want you to know right now that, that, that Jesus is just standing. And what he offers you with his nail-pierced hands, what the gift he offers you is himself. He says, this is the gift, Jesus says, it's me. It's the price I paid on the cross to wash your sins away, to give you new life, to give you hope and purpose and meaning. And he offers that gift to you right now, today. And so if that's you and you're still saying, I, I'm, I'm, not there, you know, I'm not there yet, but I, I'm hearing this and I might be open. Here's, here's my first encouragement to you. Call out now. In just a moment, I'm gonna pray. And if you wanna pray and just say, Jesus, I don't have all the pieces of the puzzle figured out, but I know enough to say, I want you, I need you, and I accept your forgiveness, you can call out to him today and become his follower. I also want to challenge you to, if, you're, if you say, well, I'm not really ready to do that yet, or maybe you say you are ready, and, and if, you, even if you've said yes to Jesus or you're still investigating Jesus, uh, we have Bibles, a little Christmas gift for you. If you've never received Jesus or if you want to learn more about him or if you cry out for him today, uh, you can pick, we have them in English and Spanish, and right out the doors here on the right, there's a whole table with these, and if you want to pick up a Bible, please do, and that's just our gift to you to encourage, and there's a 50-day reading plan there to get you started on how to read the Bible, and so I'd encourage you to open the book, and then also, if you say, you know, I'm here and I'm listening or I'm online, online and I'm listening, but I don't, I don't know enough or for some reason I'm not really ready to say yes to Jesus yet. Here's my encouragement to you. Keep asking questions. Ask lots and lots and lots of questions. And keep learning about Jesus. We have a whole ministry here at Shoreline called Perspectives. And all it is is people get together and they ask questions about Jesus and about the Bible. And they say, I don't get this. I don't get that. What about that? It's totally safe. It's totally comfortable. You see, you got, you got a group that meets just for people that don't know Jesus yet to ask questions? Absolutely. And I encourage you just to go to the Connection Center and say, tell me more about, the, if you can't remember the word perspectives, if you just say, tell me about that group of about people who have questions about stuff. And they'll, put, they'll take your name and your number and somebody will call you and get you connected to that group. But keep asking questions. This is a safe place where you can be while you're trying to understand who Jesus is. And then also talk with the pastor. I would challenge you after the first of the year, uh, we're going to actually close our offices between Christmas and New Year's and give our staff a little break. But after the first of the year, we're all back here again. And if you say, but I'm not a Christian yet, but I want to talk with a pastor, or if you pray with me right now in just a moment to receive Jesus, and you say, I want to talk with a pastor about how to start growing in my faith, you call after the first of the year, and we will set up time for you to meet with the Shoreline pastor, and we'll talk with you and pray with you and start walking with you towards Jesus to learn more about him or to start growing in your faith with him. But a thousand years before Jesus came, I mean, think about this, a thousand years before Jesus came, 300 years before crucifixion even existed, David wrote Psalm 22 and prophesied that Jesus, that the one who would be born in the manger would die for our sins. And Jesus came and he fulfilled that completely in minute detail. He bore our sins. He paid the price. And then he died. Then he rose again. Then he ascended. And he's with us today. And so Lord Jesus, we pray this Christmas season that we would be captured by the whole story of you. Not, not just the Christmas story, as beautiful as that part of it is. But let us understand that the whole story of your leaving the glory of heaven, your coming Emmanuel God with us, your living a life with no sin and no wrong, your bearing all of our guilt and sin on the cross and carrying our sin and, and being mocked and rejected and, 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 and yet bearing it all for our sake. The fact that you died for, and were dead for three days and that you rose again in glory. Let that story capture our hearts. The fact that in your ascended body that you had meals and met with people and talked with them and taught them and that you ascended to the right hand of the Father. And now by your spirit, you're here with us. Lord, this whole story has changed our lives or if it hasn't yet, it could. And so help us understand what you've done and weave together in our hearts both the manger and the cross and the empty tomb. 